Okay. I am going to send it right back to you in just a couple of minutes. So, um, so just hold those thoughts, and then you're going to get the chance to go back. But I really appreciate you guys um, just giving me your attention while uh, I'm giving parts of this message because I'm just, we're just going to kind of keep going back and forth a little bit. But as I mentioned, we're in this new series called No Problem. The problem with this series is it's about two words that are very difficult for a lot of us to say, especially about the big things in life. And those two words, and you might want to write this in your notes, are I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, saying I'm sorry is, is a difficult thing to do, um, and it's not something we, we necessarily love to do. But most of the time, I guess, apologizing isn't a huge deal, because most of the time we're apologizing for, like, really menial things, you know, like bumping into somebody and being like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, or uh, how many of you are terrible at responding to text messages, and you respond, like, a week and a half later or something like that, and you have to say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm just not responding to you. Yeah, like, little things like that aren't normally that big of a deal, but sometimes um, apologizing can be awkward. It can be uncomfortable. Like, for example, um, ha have you ever had somebody say they're sorry to you, um, but you're still really mad at them, <laughs> and you're trying for it not to feel awkward, and you're trying to, like, downplay your emotions, but you, so you're like, oh, you know, like, it's all, it's all good, like, don't worry about it, even though you don't mean a word of it. Have you ever done that to anybody where you, you don't mean yeah, you know, you forgive somebody. Yeah, how, how about the reverse? Um, whenever somebody says they're sorry, but you are 100% sure that they don't mean it. Have you ever had somebody do that to you? Yeah, of course. Um, that kind of reminds me of a Saturday Night Live skit about a girl named Gilly. Yeah, so we all know whenever we or someone else is giving a fake apology, kind of like Gilly right there, the words, I'm sorry, can often come out of our mouths, but a lot of times when we say I'm sorry, we don't feel sorry. A lot of times um, we don't think we did anything wrong, and a lot of times, even though we said we're sorry, we don't have any intention on changing our behavior in any way. Um, so I want to give you some time in your small group to talk about this idea of apologizing, so go ahead and talk about these questions right now. All righty. Let's bring it back up here for a little bit. So, truth is, we could probably spend a considerable amount of time swapping stories about times where we've either given a fake apology or received a fake apology, but today, I don't wanna talk about other people's apologies. Today, I want us to focus inward and talk about our apologies. See, when you're little, you might have thought that there were two magic words. The words are, I'm sorry, and that those words would just fix everything. You know, like if you ever took another kid's toy or if you got caught pulling another kid's hair, there was an adult who would swoop in and they would tell you to say, I'm sorry, and what would that do? It would magically fix the problem, right? The only thing is, is as we get older, we begin to realize that apologizing is more complicated than that. And the reason you know that is because anytime where you've been hurt by somebody, you want somebody's apology to you to be sincere. You want it to be real. Now, this probably won't come as a surprise to you, but the Bible has a whole lot to talk about apologies, and specifically about how we should give apologies. There's tons of different scriptures that talk about how when we do something wrong, we should do what the Bible says is confess. We should say to the person what we've done wrong and identify that thing, where we've messed up or where we've sinned. For example, King David. The Bible says that King David was a man after God's own heart. So that means he was, he was a guy who was a pretty spiritually, you know, he, he was kind of a, you know, just a, a tear above the rest when he, when he would seek out God. The problem was is that even though he was a man after God's own heart, he made some pretty big mistakes in his life, as some of you may know. Um, and there's a particular passage that I want to talk about where it's in Psalm 32 where, where David identifies the fact that he is screwed up in a major way. And in this particular passage, he focuses on apologizing in this case, in this instance, specifically to God. Check out the screen and read along with me here. So it says Psalm 32 verse 5. It says, finally, I confessed all of my sins and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. 
So he, he confessed, he stopped trying to hide the things that he knew he should be sorry for. Now, I get it. Sometimes whenever you feel like you have to say you're sorry, it feels like a box you're supposed to check off the list. Like, yeah, I need to apologize to the person, like whatever. I just want to move on. It can kind of feel like a chore. But in this instance, I don't think that David's apology to God was just him checking off a box. I think that David confessed to God and was truly sorry for what he did because he truly loved God and he wanted his relationship with God to be made healthy again. And so my question to us today as, we're, as we read this passage is, what if we took that same approach? What if you and I, anytime we had to say an apology, we didn't feel like it was a requirement that we had to do, like checking off a checkbox, but what if we saw it as a gift that we got to give someone out of love. See, when we mess up like we see da David did and he apologized to God, saying I'm sorry is a very important step, but, and it's really important you don't miss this, that's not the whole story. There's more to it. There's more to it. There's more than just saying the words I'm sorry. In fact, if you look at scripture and the more you begin to learn about scripture and learn about this idea of forgiveness, the more it becomes clear that, and you're going to definitely want to write this down because this is the bottom line of my message, is that I'm sorry is not enough. I'm sorry is not enough. When we've sinned against God or others, an apology has to be followed by a change and behavior. I'm sorry is not enough. When we have sinned against God or other people, an apology has to be followed up by a change in behavior. As you guys are writing that down, I want to change gears on you for just a second and tell you that, you know, every time we talk about Jesus at the, at the warehouse, we talk about how he was sinless. He was perfect in every way. However, it's interesting to note, if you're not familiar with Jesus, um, there were actually a lot of people when Jesus was on earth who believed that Jesus, despite our, our belief that he was sinless and perfect, he had a lot to apologize for in their eyes. Specifically, uh, there were religious leaders who believed this about Jesus. Um, in fact, they were offended by nearly everything that Jesus did. Uh, he was misunderstood, and they didn't like it whenever he didn't observe the laws and the rules that they, the religious leaders, made up in addition to God's laws. They didn't like it that, it, that he didn't follow their rules in addition to what God's word had to say. And they really didn't like it whenever he hung out with and interacted with people who they considered to be the scum of the earth, sinful people that they should never uh, come into close contact with. Now, if you've been to the warehouse any length of time, you already know this. If you grew up in church, you, you know this. But if you're new to church, if you're new to learning about Jesus, um, you should know that Jesus did, in fact, have a tendency to hang out with people that the other religious leaders wouldn't have been caught dead with. Um, some, some of these people were people who made money in questionable ways known as tax collectors. Um, now, tax collecting uh, today, it's kind of straightforward. You know, it doesn't necessarily sound very evil. We don't love to do it, pay our taxes, but it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward and, and pretty honest today. But back in Jesus' time, um, it was not this way. And back in Jesus' time, a tax collector was notorious for lying, for cheating, and for stealing people. He would charge you an amount, but you had no idea if that amount was what you actually owed. And usually he would charge more than was, what was owed, and he would, he would give the money to the government, and he would pocket the rest. Making it even worse, a lot of times, he would prey on people who were the poorest of the people. And so these people who had nothing to begin with, he would take even more than, than what they were, that, to, that were the point where they couldn't even survive, and, and there was nothing they could do because he held all the power. And so it makes sense why these tax collectors were so hated by the people and by the religious leaders and why they were so upset when Jesus decides one day that he is going to hang out with one of them who I want to tell you a story about right now. But see, even though it didn't make sense to them, you need to know this in, in this story and in your life. Jesus always has a reason for everything he does. Jesus always has a reason for everything he does. And so I want to take a look at the book of Luke where we find a very famous story about an interaction between Jesus and this famous tax collector. You probably know the name. His name is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. It comes from Luke 19, verses 1 through 6. Follow along on the screen with me. 
Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector. He was the the head of all the tax collectors in the region, and he had become very rich. And we know why, because he was constantly taking more than what people actually owed and keeping it for himself. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass by that way. Was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quickly, come down. I must be a guest at your home today. Well, Zacchaeus, he climbed down quick and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. Now, I want you to notice something about this passage. Jesus didn't do what everybody thought he should have done. They thought he should have screamed at Zacchaeus. He didn't scream at him. They thought that maybe he should shame him or just all ignore him completely or or maybe list out all of his sins so that everybody could, so he could be publicly humiliated, but he doesn't do this. He doesn't condemn Zacchaeus in this moment. No, instead, as Jesus did with Zacchaeus, and I think he, he probably does this with you, a lot of times he doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us grace and he just wants for to be able to spend time with us. That's why he invites, uh, he asks if he can come over to Zacchaeus' house because a lot of times whenever Jesus invites himself to spend some time with us and we get to know him, all of a sudden our lives begin to radically change because we see things from an eternal perspective. Now, we, we, we see here that because Jesus says, hey, I wanna go hang out at your house today, all of a sudden we see this backlash from the, from the, the people that are around. They're ticked off uh, because of this interaction that's going on between this notorious thief who's Zacchaeus and Jesus. And it goes on to say, but the people were displeased. They're ticked off. Uh, he has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Now, honestly, Zacchaeus himself, he probably was just as shocked as the people were uh, that were ticked off that Jesus would just invite himself over to this sinner's house because he knew that he should be called out for all the things he had done wrong. He knew that people hated him and for very, very good reason, which is probably why Jesus' unexpected kindness changed Zacchaeus so dramatically that we get to see in this very next couple of verses. I want you to watch. Zacchaeus, he's walking in his life in a certain direction. He's, he's completely going against everything that's right. And all of a sudden, in this one interaction with Jesus, he does a 180 and he begins to walk in a totally different direction. So they're back at Zacchaeus' house, and here's what it says. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus, he stood before the Lord and said, holy cow, I'm wrong. I'm gonna give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I'm not gonna just give them back what I stole from them. I'm gonna give them back four times as much. Do you see the immense change that Zacchaeus makes in this moment? He didn't just say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, just something to kind of get, get it over with. He decided to do everything within his power, not just to say the words, I'm sorry, but to do everything he could to make wrong things right, both with God and the people that he had hurt. Now, Jesus clearly understands that this guy means what he says because it goes on to say, salvation has come to this home today. For this man, you, Zacchaeus, you have shown yourself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man... That's Jesus, that's the name he referred to himself more than any other name. The son of man came to seek and to save those who were lost, those who, who didn't know the right way to heaven, those who didn't, ha- didn't have the conscience that they needed to follow Jesus. That's why Jesus came. See, when Zacchaeus realizes Jesus' love for him, even after everything he had done, there was like the flip of a switch and he didn't give a half-hearted apology, which we can so often do. He didn't grudgingly say those magic words, you know, just so that he could get it over with and check a box off a list. No, Zacchaeus, he took responsibility. He took responsibility uh, for the things he had done wrong and he committed to not just saying, I'm sorry, but also to making things right. He repented and he turned away from all the wicked things that he was doing and he turned toward a relationship with Jesus which causes us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do. But because of a relationship with Jesus, we do. And we see Zacchaeus in this moment. He's motivated to love others by apologizing and making things right with them. See, 
just like we learn from the, the passage back in Psalms and we see from the story of Zacchaeus. David and Zacchaeus, they both messed up. Why? Because they were human. Guess what? You're human. Guess what? You're gonna mess up. But when we do, we need to say we're sorry. But an apology is not enough. I'm saying I'm sorry is not enough. When we've sinned against God or others, an apology has to be followed up by a change in our behavior. So I want you guys to take some time in your groups to discuss these questions. All right, bring it up here, guys. Bring it up here for just, just another minute. I'm going to give you a, one more chance to have some small group time. But if I could have your attention, that would be, I'd really appreciate it. Um, cause, and the reason I want your attention is because I, I want to get really personal for just a second. Um, I want to get really personal, and I want to ask you something that's a little uncomfortable, but I think it's a, it's a question worth asking, and um, it's, it's something that we all need to really consider, and that is this. Is there anybody in your life that you need to sincerely apologize to right now? Is there anyone in your life that you need to sincerely apologize to right now? Or is there someone in your life who you have apologized to, but they are waiting for you to make a true change in your behavior? For you, maybe it's in your relationship with God. Maybe it's in your relationship with God. Have you lately been making decisions that don't reflect what God would want for you and from you in your life? Are you saying things or smoking things or drinking things or chewing things or watching things or doing things with other people that you shouldn't be doing and that are a slap in the face to a God who hung on a cross for you? If that's the case, there's forgiveness there but it's more than just an empty apology. It's got to be where we say we are truly sorry and then we change our ways, but here's the thing, you can't change your ways on your own because we're sinful, fallen people, but if you have the love of Christ in your heart, if you've accepted Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can change and you can do a 180 as we saw with Zacchaeus. Or for you, is it not necessarily with God, but is it with another person? Is there someone whom you've hurt that is still waiting to hear the words come out of your mouth that you are truly and genuinely sorry for what you did or said to them, or they're waiting for you to change your ways. If so, I wanna challenge you, do not let today go by without working on that relationship, without saying, you know what, I'm gonna do what I can do because you carry it around like a weight on your shoulders if otherwise. And it's a weight for them because they, they feel this unforgiveness towards you. And it's a weight for you because you know that there's something that you've left undone that we need to make right. And so don't wait to repair that relationship. Do it literally today. See, whether you need to ask forgiveness from God, from other people, or in most cases, it's going to be both with God and with other people. It's never easy to admit that we're wrong. We always come up with reasons why and, and, and you know, we, we, we justify our actions and we act like we don't need to say that we're sorry when we actually do. But listen, saying I'm sorry whenever we've done something wrong is always the right thing even, even though it's never the easy thing. But it's how we grow. It's how we heal. It's how we grow closer to God. And so I wanna highlight one thing. It's important to realize that when you ask God for forgiveness, he will always forgive you. No questions asked. If you sincerely mean you're sorry, he will always, always, always forgive you. But unfortunately, that is not true of other people. Not always, when you say, I'm sorry to someone else, will they forgive you. But listen to me, that is not on you. That is not within your control. That is not something that you can do because that's up to them. All you can do is what you're responsible for. And that is for giving a sincere apology and changing your behavior. And so do this. Ask God for forgiveness. If there's something in your life that you've been doing that you need to ask God for forgiveness for, whether it be just, you know, in the privateness of your own life or with other people, ask God for forgiveness. Take responsibility. Say the words, I am so sorry. Make a change. And then forgive yourself. And keep going so that you can keep growing.
You've got to know that you have to be able to forgive yourself after you're done with apologizing because that's sometimes the hardest thing to do is believing that you can truly make a change. See, when we start this new year, 2023, I pray and I hope that you and I, we will have enough love for God and for each other that we will go beyond the empty apologies and the fake forgiveness. And instead, we will look at the life of David and at the story of Zacchaeus, and we will remember that an apology saying, I'm sorry, is not enough. That whenever we have sinned against God or against other people, it has to be, the apology has to be followed up by a change in behavior. I'm gonna give it back to you guys for your last small group time, and at the very end, I'm gonna close us out in prayer. Okay, so go ahead and discuss these questions. So I hope you guys, um, I hope you guys had a, a really great discussion today. I hope you guys got to talk about some, maybe some apologies that, that you need to make with somebody that are, you know, I know it's, it can be difficult to identify those things, but it's so important, so important. So, hey, before you guys uh, start putting your folders away and stuff, just give me your attention for just a second. I'm going to pray for us, um, but before I do, I want to remind you, um, first, your leaders have calendars for you, um, and so all of you guys, if you would, take those home. Those are brand new, um, so please make sure those get into your parents' hands or onto your refrigerator or whatever so they can make it into your calendar. Second, um, the, the uh, Wednesdays at the warehouse are back and I wanna ask you to try and make a special effort uh, to make Wednesdays at the Warehouse a priority so that you can be spiritually, so you can be spiritually uplifted during the week um, and make that a thing this year. And also, I just wanna say how proud I am for all of you. We have a huge uh, crowd today. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of small groups had to add extra chairs and stuff like that. That's awesome. Um, I know you don't aren't completely, it's not completely within your power if you can't drive, but if you, if you can make every effort to be here on the weekends, you are making a spiritual investment and, and you can never go wrong doing that. And so try and make it as we get into this new year. Start off on the right foot, make it a resolution that you're gonna make coming to the warehouse uh, on the weekends and Wednesdays a priority. So let me pray for you um, and then you guys are dismissed. Father, come before you tonight, uh, today and... Um, God, we, we, we pray that if there is somebody in our life that we need to say we're sorry uh, to, that we would find the courage um, and the bravery to be able to do that and that you would give us the right words to say and also the right actions to follow. God, as we got to see from the story of Zacchaeus and the life of David, that just saying I'm sorry is, is not enough. It has to be followed up by a change in behavior. And so like Zacchaeus, help us to do a 180. If, if there's an area of our life that we keep saying we're sorry about, but, but we keep going back and doing the same thing over and over again, help us to, to be so grateful for your grace in our life, but not take advantage of that grace, but instead show you our love by, by being obedient to you. And so God, um, thank you for each and every person in this room and help us to have an awesome week and to be a light in the world. It's in your name we pray and everyone said, amen. Love you guys, see ya.